Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Obertashaka's show. Uh, this morning, uh, we will have the second part of the two-part series on the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And um, we have the privilege again to have the foremost expert on the true Dr. Martin Luther King, the revolutionary Dr. Martin Luther King, Professor Menu Ampen. Good to have you, brother. The first show focused on the revolutionary Martin Luther King. Today, uh, we're gonna focus on his assassination. Um, Manu, it's good to have you. How you doing? I'm doing great, Doc. I'm glad to be back. Good. Yeah, I know everybody's um, looking forward to this interview. Uh, before we get into this, I wanted to uh, just do a, a few reminders to people. Um, first, <clears throat> I want the viewers that haven't subscribed to hit the subscriber button because this show uh, finally, while we have a lot of viewers, uh, the important thing is the number of subscribers. And we've just gone over a thousand and that gives us certain kinds of things that we can do. You're gonna see advertised under the show, uh, click on where you can click on directly to buy books, for example. There's a lot of other things we'll be able to do. So hit the subscriber button. Uh, the second thing is um, we have the three books, The Integration Trap, Generation Gap Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality, um, and um, The Art of Leadership Volume 1. Those three are available on Gumroad if you go to Gumroad. And we have right now available a download, a DVD download on uh, mastering. It's called Mastering the Masters, Dogon and African-American Apprenticeship Systems. And so you can download those if you purchase them. And for people who purchase the integration trap, you get a, a free, it's about a 44 page uh, piece on the sixfold stages to mental freedom. It's an introduction to something that we'll be going deeper into. So some people have already purchased uh, their books and DVD, and uh, we sent them to you. Some of you should have already received them. Of course, what the post office says uh, is the time that people get stuff and when you actually get it is two different things. And then um, after that, we will have other DVDs on Malcolm X and uh, others that will be available uh, as well uh, later on, probably today or tomorrow. So now what we wanna do is get into uh, this discussion uh, with uh, Professor Menu Ampen. And um, while the primary focus of this discussion is gonna be on the assassination, uh, we wanna do a little background and back up. And when we conclude also uh, some other things that have to do with uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's historical uh, importance. Um, in the last show, uh, Professor Maynard, you made an important uh, observation uh, when you made the point that it's, in, it's incorrect to define uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King as an integrationist. And you gave, I thought, a pretty good answer there or point that a lot of scholars don't make, that uh, King came out of a Black community and uh, Black culture, and you made the point of uh, middle-class uh, Black culture, which, by the way, Ella Baker came out of. A lot of people miss that when they talk about her. Um, so I wanted to start this off by putting King within a deeper context. And I, I have a motive because a lot of people, uh, Black people question whether we have a culture. And um, that shows that some of us are drinking the Kool-Aid and it's a historical Kool-Aid that some of our historians 
have fed us. You know, they've actually given us a drink that said, we lost our culture in slavery, and then a lot of us buy it. Uh, so the uh, question that I have for you is, in what ways do you think African-American culture contributed to King's radicalization or transformation into a revolutionary? And also, uh, why didn't more ministers in SCLC embrace King's radical agenda? Well, I appreciate the question. You know, Dr. King, uh, you know, him being born and bred and growing up in, a, in the Black community uh, in Atlanta, in the Auburn area of Atlanta, which is a traditionally Black neighborhood, uh, this had a tremendous impact on King because his father and his father's father, there was a longstanding tradition of, uh, of Black ministers in his family and a part of a, long, a longer history of Black people being in a, in a Black community. And obviously, Dr. King, you know, growing up in the South, in Atlanta, and he didn't necessarily have to grow up in the South because there's white nationalism and white uh, racism and vicious white, so-called white supremacy all over the country. But in Atlanta in the South, you know, King was born and bred in that environment. So it was, it was clear to him that we had a history that we had to understand and embrace. And, you know, King was a very good student. I mean, he was in college at, the, at Morehouse at the age of 15. So it was very uh, precocious and very sharp. And one of the things that was clear early on is Dr. King understood that education had to be functional. He wrote about the purpose and function of education as a very, very young student. So for him, it wasn't just abstract information or abstract sermons for that matter. It was really a practical approach to looking at where our community was. And so for King, any, any sermon he gave, he usually would give a historical background, but certainly every speech. There's no speech that King just kind of dived into the issues at the moment but it was a historical approach and historical background. And King was linked to our community going way back. For example, his organization that was founded, the SCLC or the Southern Christian Leadership Conference that they founded in 1957, they had their annual retreats at the Penn Center. At the Penn Center there in, in, in South Carolina, this is part of the Gullah and Geechee environment. So, you know, when folks look at the tradition of black culture, we, got, we look at Georgia and South Carolina and those sea islands. And at, out of all of the places that they could have had to retreat, they chose the Penn Center and to go to that area where you have the legacy of a uh, black linguistic and cultural history that links us as much as any other country, uh, sorry, as much as any other culture among us in the US back to West Africa. And this is very significant. So strategically, King chose that area to always ground his lieutenants. And so there were people who were moving forward with Dr. King. So like, you know, the, the name of the organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So there was a bunch of ministers, Abernathy, Young, and, and many others, uh, Hosea Williams, and they were being radicalized and motivated and moved by King. So it was King moving and motivating those folks. I don't think all of them would have continued to be as progressive if they weren't around Dr. King. And we can see that after King was assassinated in April of 68, that some fell off and some became who they were probably. So I'm, I'm not sure, this, this might be a, a radical view, but I'm not so sure what would have happened with SCLC down the road if they had continued year after year after year. King was a great organizer to be able to bring people together. You know, he, he, he was able to bring together diff, different factions in that, in that manner, but some of the uh, folks in that nucleus uh, it took a lot of leadership to be able to keep those people into one unit of folks working for a common goal. But I think that his grounding and nurturing in that community was very significant to his outlook and his uh, and the motivation for his work centered in the black community because he never steps outside of our community. He never moved anywhere else. He never he never uh, went to an integrated church. He stayed at Ebenezer Baptist, Baptist Church, and we know the church has been a central institution historically among Black folks in the, in the U.S., and King was a part of that, you know, radical tradition. And this is why he had not, not just a Sunday gospel, but a political gospel, an economic gospel, a social gospel to make the community like, uh, you know, this beloved community that is that so many ministers talk about on Sunday, but King wanted to make it a reality. So I think for him... There's no separation of King in the, in the community and no aspect of his life was integrated from his family, his neighborhood, his church, his organization. 
completely all black. That's a very important set of points you're making there. Um, and your last point about he never stepped out of our community. King had a critique of blacks who did. He, he made the comment, he was referring to middle-class blacks, uh, which was a growing group then, not nearly the size it is now. And he said that basically what happened with middle-class blacks is those that, those that left the community, he said, they would leave their community and then their circumstances would change. And then he said, their manner of behavior would change. And then he said, their loyalties would change. And so he was describing something, the very opposite of what he was experiencing and uh, what most blacks were experiencing. And so that was uh, one example. Um, so, and, and you know, your point about a long tradition of living in that area and also seeing his father who would stand up to racism, um, even though it turns out his mother ran the house and ran the father. Yeah. <laughs> Most people don't know that. Yeah. And King resented that and said that wasn't gonna happen to him. <laughs> and he was coming out of a patriarchal period where men are supposed to rule, but the reality is in black families, that depends. <laughs> so um, that's an important point that you're making there. Um, also, one of the key things, you know, I think that it's pretty obvious is King coming out of the black church, a lot of blacks in the North are gonna dismiss this as, oh yeah, that's Christianity, that's a white boy's thing. Black church is a black creation. And that black creation's got a lot of African in it. And if you look at King's whole style, for example, of preaching, that's a sing song West African style. It's the second strongest style of speaking that blacks have, and it's purely African. You know, it's African translated into this reality. And not only the church, but the black community in general drew from a democratic tradition. And while King himself was a charismatic leader and his group could make decisions sometimes that came from the group, if you look at the way King functioned, most of the time he was responding to the community. Yeah. He responded to the community in Montgomery bus boycott, in Albany, Georgia, in Memphis, you know? Those were all things where he was responding to the community. That's a part of a democratic tradition. He also said he was a mouthpiece for the people. So he saw he had a responsibility to represent people's interests, not himself. And just one other thing I would note, um, we often confuse because they're both called Christian, the black church, the white church. You know, we miss some things. What's the core essence of the black church? Spirit, spirit, spirit. And the blacks who founded the black church, they were not into theology. They were into spirit. But at turning points in King's life, in the movement and before, what inspired him? Spirit, God talked to him, told him, Martin, don't be afraid, stand up and fight. It's kitchen table. In the midst of the Montgomery bus boycott, when he hadn't picked himself to be no leader, never thought he would be, and now he's facing all these crises, home being bombed and everything else. You know what I mean? Hmm. He was trained to be a minister. And so spirit, so all I'm saying is, what King came out of was an act of culture. And that act in uh, the Montgomery bus boycott was one hell of an act of culture. But there's a whole lot up in it and the black liberation movement, when it aspires to its highest level, it has that. One other thing I wanna say about King. King had this regality and nobility about him, but that was common to black people. That was nothing exceptional for him. He cared, of course, he was king. We call him, as I said in the last show, the Lord. But the fact is, that was the attitude of most everyday Black folks. And these were people that were, you know, mopping Miss Ann's kitchen or having to, you know, do janitorial work or shine shoes. They did it with dignity. You know what I mean? They carried themselves with great pride. And King manifested that. So, you know, that's what I call Black identity. He came out of that. 
Malcolm came out of assimilated, I did too, assimilated identity. His family didn't, but he did. There's reasons for it, I ain't going into it. And then he went into his African thing. King approached it from his black thing and then also dealt with Africa. So don't underestimate this culture. Like when King said we were creative, when he was talking about he wasn't trained to build power, but he did say we were creative. Well, that's a hell of a lot. You outfox the fox. You brer rabbit at him. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's no small thing. You know what also, Doc, you know, in addition to those points, is that even his name and his father's influence, because both King and his father were born Michael King. Mm. And when King was very young, right around seven or something around that age, his father changed their name to Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King Jr. in the radical tradition of the original Martin Luther in the early 1500s, who challenged the corruption of the Catholic Church. And so the original Martin Luther was an inspiration that his father embraced. And so the young king growing up understood that the church uh, or the view of religion and spirituality could not be abstract, but it had to be integrated in, in our day-to-day -day life. So that's why he never separated political activism from the sermon on Sunday. They were always linked together. And his name uh, given to, his, to him by his father is uh, a part of that tradition. And they didn't have to only, you know, look at Martin Luther in Germany, but there's a radical black tradition right here in the U.S. where there is Prophet Nat Turner or anybody else who used the biblical inscription to say that this is bogus, to say that somehow there's some kind of curse on black folks, curse on ham that justifies slavery. Black folks didn't believe that, and Dr. King certainly didn't. That's why he challenged, uh, you know, the outward white supremacists and also those who were supposedly white moderates, white liberal, the white church, he challenged them as being hypocritical and rec recognized that they were not gonna be a friend. And one thing about King is, you know, his noble nature and character, he was a man of tremendous principle, couldn't buy him off, mm -hmm. couldn't get him to do something because of uh, money. And like, I think you mentioned in our last program, he gave away all of the money, that 54,000 for the Nobel Peace Prize. He didn't give it just to his organization. He gave it to all the, the main civil rights organizations. This is the kind of man he was. Hmm. More concerned about unity and collective work than to focus on individual accolades. So the man of great principle and vision to recognize that we had to stay together in this long-term struggle for black freedom. Those are good points. And you know, you know, your point about the spirit and the politics that is really the essence of the best of our culture. One's not separate from the other, you know? Um, and that, you know, really defined him. And your point about his nobility was based on character, which is the case with black folks in general. And it is a quality that's African because nobility in Africa had nothing to do with power. It had to do with the quality of character. And if you're going to talk about the real nobles, they were the best men or best women. Women didn't have to pass any tests. The men did. Isn't that funny? <laughs> that shows you who's running things. They said, ain't no way in the world. I'm your mother, queen mother. And the queen mother was not related to the king. I don't need to pass no tests. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the man had to go through all kinds of tests because they knew that man could go off and take them off into some funny places. You know, they can lead to death and everything else. So yeah, these are very important qualities that we shouldn't overlook and take for granted. And, and it's in the dignity of our parents, grandparents, who have these same qualities and many of us who do. Some of us are losing this. Some of us ain't got no dignity at all. You know what I mean? You hear me? <laughs> None. <laughs> and and now, now in this age where there's a whole lot of other things going on, even the most common things aren't common, like common sense. So there are some of us who are departing. So what we need to do is get back to black. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, getting back into King, um, what were some, this is hooking up with what we covered last week and it's getting in to the assassination, but what's, what were some of the specific aspects of King's radicalization that threatened the US government and the corporate elite and figures like H.L. Hunt and Lyndon Johnson? 
Well, yeah, I appreciate that, Doc. There's, uh, the FBI was very concerned about King, and they started their, their illegal, vicious Get King campaign back in 1962. And that's the year that the, the vicious campaign was launched by J. Edgar Hoover, who was the director of the FBI and, that, and the agency. And they were concerned about the growing movement and King's growing influence within the movement. And they were monitoring everything, <clears throat> everything that Dr. King did. And so uh, all of the uh, phones were wiretap places. The office in Atlanta, for example, had microphones. And so the surveillance on Dr. King was so tight that he couldn't even wiggle. And it's the most, he's the most surveillance man in the history of the country. And the FBI knew quite a bit more than the average person did because they recognized that King was embracing armed liberation movements on the African continent without hesitation or reservation. When they started talking about we rejoice with those nations in Africa that had joined the community of free nations, this was an issue because they're talking about Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Angola, Mozambique. You're talking about African nations that had won their independence through armed struggle and King prominently and then eventually publicly embracing them until, you know, these uh, conservative black folks and the media started to condemn him and King kind of backed away a little bit from making these announcements too publicly because by the time he was given a Nobel Peace Prize, he recognized the issue that, uh, you know, the media was trying to make him out to be a hypocrite. On the one hand, he's gotten a Nobel Peace Prize and notoriety, but then he's drawing attention to liberation movements. But what they were really concerned about is King in the second period. Uh, we discussed last um, program last show two weeks ago that there's two periods in King's rap in his political work. The first period that he called the civil rights period from 1954 to 65. And then after 65, when the voting rights bill was passed, the FBI clearly indicated that this man is increasingly, quote, dangerous. In fact, um, they considered, the FBI considered Dr. King to be the most, the way they phrase it, the most dangerous Negro in America, Negro man in America, because if he could, and he could help to galvanize a quarter million people in DC with the March on Washington, and then not be able to be swayed, the FBI sent a package, these phony people, they sent a package from Florida to try to uh, um, cover up the postage location and sent it to his, off his home in Atlanta, trying to break up his family. They tried to get him to commit suicide and King was firm. He didn't move to the left or right. He, he didn't bow, he didn't bend, he was unbossed and they were concerned. Now in 66, he's talking about implementing black power. He was not an advocate of the phrase black power but he eventually began to accept it as a necessary program. And he criticized some of their young brothers and sisters was talking about it more as a slogan. Said you all are just talking about a slogan. We need a program, and that's why he wrote about Black Power Defined, and the FBI following all of this. And 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 when I look, uh, Doc, at the FBI um, documents, it's clear that something needed to be done from the FBI's point of view towards King because he's talking about acquiring power for Black people. He is criticizing American foreign policy. He said that the U.S. Congress was, quote, running amok with racism. And he said that human rights was the, was the central question confronting all nations. So he's not even talking about civil rights anymore. When we start looking at all of these different elements, it's clear that the FBI in Hoover was increasingly concerned about stopping King in this campaign to, to uh, neutralize him. And that's and then later we find out about the FBI documents, particularly the one from August 25th of 1967 to neutralize black leaders. And certainly King was at the top of that list. And it's amazing to look at the FBI. Uh, in, fact, in fact, speaking about what the government's concerned about, uh, let me share this, Dr. Shaka, that most people are not aware of. So when people think about King, <clears throat> they're, they're grossly uninformed. He's the most misrepresented person in the U.S., and they don't understand what the, how the government saw him. Here's one thing that's interesting. If anybody goes to the FBI files in D.C. to look at the work of King, then they have to go to the file that says Communist Influence and Racial Matters. That's the file, communist influence and racial matters. And so if the viewers are not aware, calling somebody a communist is similar, calling, similar to calling somebody a terrorist today. 
those were the most negative things that someone can be called. And the FBI was so out of touch, they said that black folks had no case, they had no cause, and they would be influenced by those outside communists. And so um, the files are just re replete with crazy letters sent to the FBI, all kind of accusations. But that's the main file, communist influence and racial matters. And then <laughs> drilling down underneath that file is specifically called Black Nationalist Hate Groups. And that's the file under the larger communist file. And that's where you find all of these uh, records on SCLC, uh, your organization, uh, CORE, uh, SNCC, all those, uh, the Nation of Islam, uh, you name it, the Republic of New Africa. And guess what? Even the NAACP <laughs> was in this file of Black nationalist hate groups and all of the individual uh, activists were in this. And so the FBI was very concerned with uh, taking out the leadership and their records are clear about that. So they were concerned about all of what he was doing, particularly after 65, when he began to talk exclusively about human rights and the acquisition of power. Yeah, and especially as you're pointing out, because they couldn't control him. And um, he was he was really not a part of the black establishment. The new civil rights groups barely groups, people like Adam Clayton Powell were not even though his father was. Uh, Ron Dellums was not anyone. And, and by the way, people don't know this. The Black Establishment is a group formed by Booker T. Washington, W.V. Du Bois. And uh, basically, it's made up of the national institutions that Blacks have. And it's viewed as a control operation. But Ron Bennett, in his book, Negro Mood, gives the best description, analysis of the Black Establishment. And he said, they're um, militant in words and conservative in action. So they can talk a mean talk. And you were pointing out last week, a uh, week before last, that um, that group came out with the New York Times ad opposing King, opposing his positions on the war and other positions. That's the Black establishment. So King was not really in it. SNCC really wasn't. And the radical arms of um, um, CORE were not in it. And so uh, he was someone that couldn't be controlled. You know, your point about black power, um, King got caught in a bind when that uh, march against fear in Mississippi occurred. And then Willie Ricks whispered in, into Stokely Carmichael, later Kwame Torres ears, and said, say black power, say black power. And that had come to him through a conference he attended at Howard University, uh, sponsored by Adam Clayton Powell. And I pointed out to people on this show, no one else knows this. That conference was planned by him and Malcolm. Malcolm told a friend of mine um, uh, from the Caribbean that he was going to be him and uh, Adam Clayton Power going to have a Black Power conference, and he was asking him to attend it. And you know, of the two, it was Malcolm planning it. Uh, so that came up. So then King had to respond. So your point about King stressing program is very important because the problem with Black Power was a good slogan, but that's what it was: is a slogan, you know, and uh, it needed to be organized in '65. I, I took over the National Corps Convention in Durham and got 32 resolutions passed unanimously. The 33rd could not be passed. That was voting whites out of Corps. That couldn't be passed for a year because th there needed to be a constitutional amendment. And James Farm, uh, Farmer stood up and made that point. He's married to a white woman, but he was a very good man. He was very good for Corps for his period. But we had reached a period where that period was over. But basically, our chapter in CORE had advanced, and we had kicked the economic power structures behind, and we saw the need to restructure CORE. So that's what we came up with, a series of things to make the uh, chapters grassroots and economically self-reliant. And one of the things that I got voted unanimously at the National Convention in 65 was white money out of CORE. 
That's not in any history book, by the way. And James Farmer, after I toured the South that summer in 65, Watts was going up in smoke. I stayed at Farmer's house. And then that um, fall, we had a central committee meeting. That's the executive committee of CORE. And Farmer was able to get all those decisions that were unanimously adopted at the core convention reversed. And that's when I left core, you know, because it was clear we're at a turning point and now the organization had to shift and we didn't call it black power. It was programmatically black power. So that point you're making about King is uh, very important. And the point on human rights, you made this point before. And I think what was particularly threatening for the government was King was attaching to that economics. He was saying that we're past the rights phase, you know, of voting rights and civil rights. Now we're past the constitution. Now we've got to get into human rights, which is the right to a job, a good paying job, a right to a roof over your head, a right to a good education, a right to health care. And those are the kind of things that in Western Europe, they had adopted the end of World War II because of Roosevelt. They had concluded they didn't want a revolution again in Europe. They didn't want a Russian thing coming up or something else. So they adopted Roosevelt stuff, but this power elite here was into trashing it for the most part. So that was threatening to them, even though those were reforms. And by the way, I heard a comment on one of the, you know, one of the comments made by people on the show and someone said, oh, that's just reform. Reform is the basis for revolution. Reform is improving people's lives. And unless you're gonna say, you don't want to vote because that's just reform. Yeah, it's not revolution. But the point is people need to vote, that's power. People need jobs so they can feed themselves. You know, uh, So yeah, there's long-term, but there's short-term. And what I liked about your analysis last week is you stressed how the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was very practical when it came to what he saw could be achieved, internationally in his support and nationally. And that's something we should learn from. Be practical. What can you win in this situation? You know what I mean? So those observations that uh, Professor Menu Ampen is making is no joke. It's really serious. Um, now, how did the elites in this country view King's position on Vietnam, the Poor People's Campaign, and the Memphis Campaign where he supported um, Black garbage workers? Um, how did they view this um, as they were looking at King? Well, you know, from the time of, uh, from, the, from the, a specific date of, August, uh, sorry, of April, 4th, 1967. That's when King pretty much broke all ties with uh, with the government officials, with politicians, with white liberals, with white moderates, with the conservative civil rights leaders, uh, you know, like a farmer or a, even a John Lewis, people like that who were not going to go that far and start embrace. So these, these folks left their organizations because they weren't going to embrace Black power. They weren't going to embrace uh, this idea of black and white together and the struggles and all that. Black folks just said, this is our struggle and we need to be in the forefront of our struggle and we need to control it. So uh, thank you for your service, but y'all need to leave. And um, when King stayed with the young brothers and sisters in 66, then there was clearly a rift between him and Rustin and him and all of these other people, Bayard Rustin and others because uh, he did not have the same ultimate goals. King was not limited to civil rights. And when he, and King gave his speech beyond Vietnam on April 4th, 1967, that speech he spent more time than any other singular speech figuring out what he should say and how he should say it because he understood there would be no turning back after he made a definitive statement to not just say the war in Vietnam needs to stop and the US should with withdrawal troops and withdraw the billions and hundreds of millions that were being spent. But King went further to condemn the United States, as he said, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. He said that they destroyed the Vietnamese two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. And in doing so, 
it was an unmistakable, unswerving criticism. And not only did he, he indict the U.S. government, he said they needed to pay reparations. And so April 5th, that very next day, all over the country, newspapers, um, spokespeople for the more conservative uh, as, uh, elements of the movement, they condemned King. They condemned him. And King, this time, he didn't do what he did two years earlier when he started talking about international issues publicly. This time, he stood by his principles and continued to move forward. So when King broke in, on April 4th, 67, which is it's coincident that he was assassinated exactly one year to the, to the day afterwards, April 4th, 68, that's when he completely broke. And so King then recognized that it was a brand new era and they had to continue to move forward and he wanted to stay relevant. He said, how can I stay relevant and still be connected to the community dealing with what he called quote unquote Mickey Mouse Negroes. And this is in the, this is in the FBI uh, documentation. That's how he saw these people. And he, and he's, and he, con he unswervingly condemned the U.S. government. He's called them, he said it was white supremacy in the, in, uh, in the foreign policy. He said it would, Congress was running amok with racism. And then, so when he conceived of, along with his colleagues, the Poor People's Campaign, he conceived of this at the latter part of 67 because they were trying to figure out what could they do? Because nonviolence hadn't had a victory since the voting rights bill a couple years earlier. And that he knew he was losing credibility with some segment of the community. He said, well, this don't mean nothing to us. We're still in the same kind of poverty. We're still powerless. We got laws passed, so what? And so King wanted to remain relevant, so he stayed with the young people. But when he and others conceived of the Poor People's Campaign to start April April of 68, this is when he alienated, he alienated um, a larger group of people. But I think what it also did, it moved the FBI to then begin to, to target a specific time to assassinate King, to make sure he would never be able to pull off the Poor People's Campaign, which was scheduled for April 22nd of 68. And of course he was assassinated April 4th of 68. So all of these things that were happening and when King was in Memphis, it showed what uh, his focus was in Memphis in March of 68 and then early April because he was condemning the US political and economic system of capitalism. So to help black uh, sanitation workers who did not have the union support and then there's a storming rain and and these sanitation workers have to uh hide from this storm in the back of a of a of a, um, a, a, a sanitation garbage truck and then they were killed in there so king said look if we're not going to support them then what is our movement is about so for him it was about a, a increasing class issue race was always there he never abandoned the focus on black folks first but this was a, an alarm for all those people who were in opposition to human rights. They were opposition to black power and they were not going to take so-called Negro business and, and internationalize it as King began to do without hesitation or reservation. So there was a number of these campaigns that converged from Memphis and the garbage workers, sanitation workers strike, the poor people's campaign and is increasing unswerving opposition to U.S. international and foreign policy that uh, made it very clear that something was going to happen. And King always said repeatedly that he didn't think he would make it to the age of 39, but what, and people saw he seemed to be more somber about this, but at some point he seemed to accept the fact that, you know what, I'm a world historical figure and, um, and a coward dies a thousand deaths, but a real man who embraces his objective in life has to move forward and whatever happens, happens. And this is why you see him, he might be, as anybody would be concerned publicly about personal, I mean, privately about personal safety, but publicly he was as strong as any other leader in Lyon uh, during the 67, 68 campaign. And that's when it's clear that uh, the FBI and their Get King campaign had reached another level of intensity to make sure that they took him out before he can launch that poor people's campaign and continue with the sanitation worker strike in Memphis. Uh, you made reference to uh, certain documents that uh, people should look at when it comes to the FBI files. Specifically, in your research at the FBI headquarters archives in Washington, D.C., um, what was some of the specific research you did pertaining to King's assassination? 
Yeah, looking at his assassination, um, you know, it was interesting to take a look and see behind the scenes what the FBI was doing, led by J. Edgar Hoover and the next man in line, um, uh, William Sullivan. And because they had already saw King as the most dangerous black person in America back in 63. And they tried to get him to commit suicide. They always leaked information to loyal supporter, uh, reporters that would always publicize nonsense about King. And so the FBI, uh, they wanted to make sure that they could stop King in Memphis. And so what I, what I, was, what I saw is how J. Edgar Hoover orchestrated um, the media to up its attack on King, saying that this man is, so if anybody looks at articles, for example, public articles in various newspapers in, in, uh, in the beginning of 1968, January, February, March, they'll see that there were increasing attacks saying that Dr. King is irresponsible, quote unquote. He's asking people to come to Washington DC for the Poor People's Campaign where they would camp out and make sure that there was a bill of rights for the disadvantaged. There'll be a guaranteed income in the billions of dollars. And that when he said, we're not gonna leave DC, we're gonna dislocate the Capitol. Not like these January 6th insurrect, insurrectionists, but King, con, his focus is how do you dislocate a city without destroying it? And he would say that very often, how do you dislocate? In other words, what he meant by dislocation, no more business as usual. And the FBI was uh, pushing this idea that it's going to be a bloodbath in D.C., that these people camping out, Black people, the poor, from every, every ethnic group, whether it was Black people, whether it was uh, Latino American, whether it was um, Puerto Rican, whether it's Native Americans or poor whites from Appalachia, King, they, they wanted to have at least 3,000 people to actually camp out in DC and not leave and took Congress passed the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, just like the bonus marchers did in 1932. They had that as an idea that we're gonna do exactly the same thing and make sure there is no vehicular traffic into the government. There'll be no pedestrian traffic that these uh, people would literally make that their home and location for weeks and months until the Congress did something. And they would give it some weeks and if Congress did nothing, if they didn't pass a bill, the next thing would be to um, choose key cities in the country and make sure that those cities were also dislocated as well, peacefully, but still dislocated. And the FBI said, you know, he's irresponsible. We must stop him from bringing these people to the nation's capital for an irresponsible, pretty much, um, you know, we talk about a sit-in. It was even more than that. It was a live-in for, for that matter. They were going to take it over. And the FBI said no. And then when what happened was when, a sanit when black sanitation workers in late March of 68, remember he's assassinated on April 4th, when they were killed because they had no union support and they were killed in the back of the garbage truck, King went to help lead a demonstration. And what the FBI did, they... Um, they were able to, uh, to co-op some young knuckleheads to join the march and start busting up property, busting up cars, busting up store windows. And then, of course, they then come out the next day in the media in Memphis to say that Dr. King's irresponsible. He can't even control his own marchers. In fact, then they, this, these people are ridiculous. And they said, look, he ran like a chicken and ran away is what they said. So this was all orchestrated. So the FBI was trying to do everything it could to make sure that King had less and less credibility uh, among people in the public. And so now it's setting the stage there in Memphis to set him up for an assassination. But yet, you know, he's still expanding his base. He's meeting with Cesar Chavez and other leaders in the farm workers movement. So while conservative civil rights leaders begin to peel off, they weren't gonna go that far. <laughs> they knew their place. King was still expanding his base beyond focusing on the issues of confronting people of African descent in the country. But the FBI records are very clear. It became even more desperate to stop King from uh, moving forward with his, his poor people's campaign and stop him in Memphis before they can get to late April. And the records are very clear about uh, this increased um, concern. And I would even say um, desperation to stop King. 
So let's get into this assassination. Um, give us the official storyline on who uh, was involved in the assassination of Martin Luther King and why this storyline is false. Well, okay. I got this into parts, so I want to just start on layers. <laughs> okay. All right. So one thing we should we should we should present as a background, and that is uh, as King is more and more radical after '65, he's not talking about civil rights anymore. He's not focused on civil rights anymore. Anyone can see this from not only the FBI documents but from the public documents, such as Dr. King's book. Uh, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? You'll see he's not talking about civil rights. He's talking about how do you involve engaging coalitions. And how do you have, uh, he said, you know, that um, that uniformity, that, that unity doesn't mean uniformity. We don't have to agree with everybody. But what happens is that as King is embracing these principles and moving on them, uh, and he's in Memphis, after uh, some young knuckleheads, they were, were, uh, they, 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 were just, they were destroying property. They had uh, been influenced by the government. And so um, after that, King reiterated what his position had always been, that nobody has a problem when people are defending themselves and their property and their family when being attacked. He said that the issue of nonviolence in America had always been, and it was thus a non-issue, but it always been whether or not it's tactically wise to carry a gun or a knife in a demonstration. So he left the demonstration in late, in late March in Memphis when people were busting up property. He said, this has nothing to do with our concern as marchers and demonstrators. And every march, every demonstration had the same elements. And that is, they always they always boycotted white businesses that did not support the movement. You don't support us if, if you are neutral, quote unquote, or continuing with white, white supremacy, white nationalism and Jim Crow, then you will pay an economic price. So when stories came out about this disruption during the march. J. Edgar Hoover leaked the story. You can see he leaked the story to the local press in Memphis and said that Dr. King is a, he's a chicken and a coward. He ran away from a, a melee that they themselves, the FBI created, but Dr. King was staying at the, at the Holiday Inn. And uh, the Rivermont Holiday Inn is where he was staying but yet there was a boycott of white businesses. So Jago Hoover, the, the head of the FBI, they leaked the story and said, Dr. King is a hypocrite. He's telling the black community to boycott white businesses, but he's staying at the plush Rivermount Holiday Inn. Why don't he be more, um, more honest and not so hypocritical? Why don't he go to the so-called Negro Hotel, the Lorraine Motel down the street uh, uh, on the other side of town? And so King recognized that he didn't, he was, he was going to fight a, me, a media battle. So he then had to leave the Holiday Inn and go to the Lorraine Motel. And so King was downstairs. They had uh, already uh, reserved his room as they would do. There's only certain places black people could stay. So he's at the, the Holiday Inn. And then it was some body that claimed to be one of King's men, quote unquote, that said, you know what, Dr. King does not like the bottom floor. He likes the upstairs scenic view. So they moved him at the Lorraine Motel. We're talking uh, the first couple of days in April of 68, they moved him in front of room 306 where the balcony was. And then, uh, and so they, they lured him there through bogus media reports. J. Edgar Hoover uh, leaked the stories. You can see from their records that these bogus stories of him being a hypocrite came from the FBI. And in front of that room, 306 on April 4th, in the evening around 6 p.m. is where he was shot and assassinated, where it was a high powered rifle that sh shoots him in the neck, neck and severs his spine. He dies right there in uh, front of room 306 at the Lorraine Motel, the same room that he was lured to by the FBI that leaked this bogus and fake story. So they claim if it has been all these, uh, these assassination uh, commissions and they claim that it was a, a lone gunman, James Earl Ray. Here you got a young white racist who was a petty criminal, was caught for everything. He, he, he was caught on several occasions. He's always caught for his petty crimes of forgery and all these other things, but yet he's going to pull off the crime of the century. So they say that it was a boarding room across the street where James Earl Ray shot the, the rifle, kills King. And then uh, 
he runs downstairs and then leaves the uh, the weapon right there on, <laughs> on the ground for evidence. He doesn't take it with him. He he, <coughs> so he 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 gets out of the whole area. He leaves Memphis. Where's the all points bulletin? So he leaves he leaves Memphis. He leaves Tennessee. He leaves the U.S. He goes to can he leaves the country. He goes to Canada and he's found weeks and weeks later in London. And it, and the whole thing makes no sense whatsoever because. Um, Here's a couple of things that people need to know. On the day of the assassination, the security around King by the Memphis uh, police, uh, it went from 10, it would be normally be 10 people, was down to two on that day, just two. And one was Detective Riddick. Detective Riddick was really pretty much a, a follower of King. And Riddick said this, that two hours before the assassination, they took <coughs> him off his post. They took Riddick off his post and said that there was conspiracy on his life. And he was stunned. He said, wait a minute, I'm an unknown local detective. And so it was supposedly a three state conspiracy. So they forced him off his post without a replacement. And next thing you know, they drove him to some meeting with high level military officials. He was stunned when he walked in the room. And they and after this bogus meeting, he said he's in the car. And that's when he heard that King was assassinated uh, at that same time. And Frank Holloway was the man in charge that reduced the security. He told Holloway, uh, he told Riddick, you need to go. And so the security was, was lax. And not only that, but uh, it makes no sense all the way around because of the fact that um, um, James Earl Ray, he, the, 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 first of all, the gun could not fit. There's been reconstructed. The rifle could not fit in the boarding room bathroom where they said the shot took place. There's no way it could have even fit in the space. And someone would have been one of the greatest snipers in the history of the country to be able to balance on a kind of a bathtub like that anyway. And so James Earl Ray was claimed to be the lone gunman, but guess what? There was one reporter there from the New York Times, Earl Caldwell. Earl Caldwell was there to report on King and the movement <clears throat> there. And Earl Caldwell was never interviewed. And he was there as a reporter to report. And he said that he heard the gunfire. He didn't see what happened. But Earl Caldwell said that there was shrubbery. It's like some shrubbery was trees right there at that Lorraine Motel parking lot area. And that he said he saw a man there with a case. In that case, he said it had to have been the weapon because what, why was somebody there in the bushes? And Earl Caldwell said he saw that. The man right there, he, said he never saw his face directly, but the man was there and the man picked up his equipment and then left after the assassination. We're talking moments, Earl Caldwell was there. He was never interviewed. Caldwell said he goes back to the scene two days later and the shrubbery had been cut down to just inches. And he said, that's where he saw the man. This is a trained reporter for the New York Times and other news agencies who was there to report. And so we got all these commissions There's the there's the Assassination uh, Commission, 1975, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence um, and uh, Intelligence Activities called the Church, uh, the Church Committee. There was a House Select Com Select Committee on Assassinations in uh, 78, 79. There was a Justice Department Task Force and review of the FBI on on on, on, MS, on the MLK assassination investigations. And there's all these different reports, and they say that they did make some mistakes they should not have they should have investigated some of these items or these issues in 68 uh so that james Earl ray didn't get away or the gunman but they all claim that he's the lone gunman james Earl ray wrote a book his title is who killed martin luther king what me and nor does the family or other people close to the movement believe that this was the lone gunman who had anything if you know that he had little to do if not anything to do with King's assassination. So the whole thing does not make any sense whatsoever, but it's quite convenient. And uh, one last thing is um, David Garrow in his book, The FBI and Martin Luther King is very thorough. We're going through all of the records and details of how the FBI and is implicated in the assassination of King. And they rejoice when they assassinated him, particularly in the Atlanta office when they said, yes, great. They finally got Zorro. They called him a fox. And now we know the army intelligence was was involved with with this assassination as well. But to say that James Earl Ray is a lone gunman uh, is ridiculous. And we also know 
that the FBI had agents within King's organization, James Harrison, a young student, and even the famous photographer, Ernest Withers. Ernest oh, Withers. FBI. Yeah. He was <clears throat> well. So the FBI was, was intimately involved in, with the orchestration and the carrying out of his assassination. And uh, this has been, been demonstrated by many, but it's still not the official version. Yeah, so there's some other things as well. Um, the rifle that uh, the so-called assassin uh, used, James Earl Ray, uh, the bullets for that rifle uh, did, not, did not match the bullet that killed King, uh, number one. Number two, the rifle that James Earl um, Ray supposedly used was not sighted. When you're a sniper, you have to uh, sight a rifle for the distance and everything else. It was not sighted. Uh, so it couldn't be the rifle because it wasn't the bullet that killed King and it wasn't even sighted for someone to shoot. And it was off. When, when you shot this rifle, it didn't hit in the direction that it should. In other words, no sniper would use a rifle like this. So that is uh, one point. There's the issue of um, who was actually involved in this. There's a guy named Lloyd Jowers. You familiar with him? No, I don't, I don't know that man. Uh, Lloyd Jowers was a, a two-year police officer in the Memphis Police Department. And then later he owned a little restaurant. And this restaurant is also had rooms above it. Yes. James Earl Ray was in one of those rooms. I remember, yes. Um, Jowers met with uh, police officials, and this is confirmed by a number of sources that actually engaged in the planning of the killing of King. And Jowers' girlfriend, who was a white woman, um, testified, and Jowers later admitted that he received the rifle that was used to kill King. He received it, stored it, and on the day of the assassination, put it back together. He had disassembled it, put it back together and went to the grassy area. And then later after the shot was fired, his girlfriend and he, he later admitted that first of all, she says he comes back and his knees are full of stains from the grass that he had been in with that rifle and then that rifle was later picked up so he admitted later that he didn't do the shooting but he was involved in the shooting so that has become fairly well documented so he was he was working this out with the local police who were a part of the planning of it now also um Research has now been done on the role of the army in this. And it's clear the army did not do the actual shooting, but they were part of a number of groups uh, involved in this assassination. And um, the book that provides the uh, information on this, which I had showed Maynou earlier, is called An Act of State. And uh, it's written by a man named William Pepper, who uh, played a role in um, <clears throat> defending uh, the alleged assassin, um, James Earl Ray, to prove his innocence because the family and everyone else knew that he wasn't involved. And so he interviewed a lot of the participants in the assassination. And so one of the things that he came up with in the course of his interviews was he was able to interview some special forces people who were actually engaged in part of the assassination planning um, and operation in Memphis at the time of King's assassination. They didn't actually do the shooting, but they were trained to do it. Um, and some of his research goes into research done um, that took 18 months this is research done by a guy named Steve Tompkins, 
who was former commercial appeal investigative reporter. And what he did is uh, 18 months of uh, investigation that led to a front page uh, story um, in his newspaper called the Commercial Appeal. And um, what he shows is the Army intelligence role um, in surveying the area in which King would later be assassinated and laying out certain exit points and everything else and uh, documenting um, the uh, assassination. So, so what's important here is you've got the FBI, which you talked about, you got army intelligence, and then there's gonna be another role, the mafia, which the mafia is in this as well. But it's all state, order, state ordered because when you get this kind of hit and all these different government agencies are participating, well, that's telling you the target is a top priority target. That's telling you that various agencies of the government have collaborated on this. Now, if you get this kind of collaboration, guess what? None of these would do this on their own. So guess what? who would have to give that order? <laughs> and it would go higher than J. Edgar Hoover. It would go to the top. Use your imagination. So what his article showed was um, that there was an extraordinary fear in official circles about King and uh, the way in which he was organizing and particularly, as you pointed out, around the Poor People's Campaign. And according to him, Army intelligence was particularly concerned. Now, Army intelligence only gets concerned if they're directed to be concerned because this isn't something that army intelligence is gonna be operating on, even though they were actively engaged in surveilling black organizations. We often look at the FBI, but army intelligence was playing a pretty big role themselves. Um, so the unit that um, the investigators pointed out was involved in participating in this assassination was a unit called Special Forces Alpha 184. And this is a sniper operation, as well as a um, operation that does investigation and everything else. So a guy named Tompkins uh, interviewed uh, Special Forces soldiers, two who had been involved in this operation. And uh, one, because of the fear of a cleanup that he had observed in New Orleans, one of the uh, special forces operatives that took part in this operation had been shot in the back of the head. And he figured there was a cleanup operation going on in military intelligence. So he left the country, he went to South America. And later um, this author here, uh, William Pepper was able to interview him on a number of occasions and gave him a false name so that he could give him cover because he was afraid of really being killed if they revealed his name. But by this time, it's around 1997 when these interviews are taking place. So this is quite a bit after uh, the assassination. Uh, so this uh, Special Forces Alpha 184 sniper team uh, was in Memphis on the day of King's assassination. Um, this is one thing. Tompkins interviewed a special forces soldier who later was living in Latin America after the assassination and was able to arrange interviews with him. And um, he makes the point that um, they were in um, Memphis, April the 4th, 1968 special forces unit. Uh, the soldiers believe that um, another member of the unit um, was also involved uh, in this. In, in other words, you know, there were two units that uh, had, had been brought in or at least were called in. One was told to go back after the assassination. One was there during the assassination. Um, Pepper's research also shows this, that army intelligence 
had been uh, collecting information on um, activists for a long time, and uh, particularly with the urban rebellions that were going on. Um, and that Army Intelligence also, it's a unit uh, called the US Army Intelligence Command. Um, it's abbreviated USAINTC. Um, that this intelligence command was based in um, Maryland. And at this time, this unit had collected over 7 million files on US citizens, 7 million. So you have the FBI doing their stuff, then you have military intelligence. So these included files considered to be a threat on people that they labeled to be a threat to the US. Um, so they, this unit was also responsible for collecting data and uh, doing actual surveillance. Uh, two, two of these soldiers who were interviewed, um, who were active in covert operations, one that Pepper called Warren, the other one he called Murphy, these are not their real names. They considered to be, they considered to be interviewed provided that they use aliases. They had been involved in Vietnam in covert operations. And um, then um, they were involved in 1967 uh, in urban rebellions. And to show you how uh, army intelligence operated, uh, when they sent in covert operatives into whatever city it was where you had these armed rebellions that people call riots, they were really urban rebellions. Um, they were given mugshots. They had files and they had mugshots and they had authority to assassinate certain activists if they had the opportunity. So this is, this is background for the people who are being trained for the assassination of King. Um, so at this time, Army Intelligence had put out uh, a green, green and white mug books. And these green and white mug books had the profiles of what they called ra radical activists in various cities. And you can imagine what radical activists meant. That just meant anybody that they had labeled as someone that they wanted to take out. Because at this time, you had a limited number of well-organized activists. These or urban rebellions were spontaneous. They were coming from the grassroots. So they were really being given authority to take out a lot of grassroots people who were just into you know, being opposed to police oppression because almost all these urban rebellions were brought on by police repression. So according to Warren, one of the aliases and Murphy, they were part of an eight man team operation um, that was detached and sent to Memphis. They were part of an eight person team. Um, they were dressed as civilians and um, they were serving among other things as a reconnaissance team, but they had also been trained uh, for assassination. Uh, they had gone into Memphis um, uh, February the 22nd, according to this guy. And they, their job was to reconnaissance, do reconnaissance on hotels in the downtown area. And then their reconnaissance also was on exit routes. Obviously, if you are killing somebody, your assassin has got to have an escape route. Um, at the time the king was assassinated, there was a hoax auto chase, um, timed at the same time as king was shot. This was designed to detract from the assassination. Um, so the team leader, this, this is very detailed stuff here. The team leader got final orders for deployment. 7.30 a.m. March the 29th, 7.30 a.m. March the 29th. Um, Murphy and them, they were briefed before leaving Camp Shelby uh, for Memphis. 
uh, at 4.30 a.m. in the morning. This is what they were told. They were told that their target was to shoot uh, in body mass and in uh, sniper terms, that means the main body of the person, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And then they were told, of course, why. He was an enemy of the state. He was a threat to the order of the society and blah, blah. And they, and they called him a dirt bag, you know? And so while this group did not actually do the shooting, they were there prepared for it. And then there's a testimony of the head of the fire department where the black uh, firefighters had been removed, which uh, had a, uh, a, a, on the top floor, the roof of that fire department, you had a view of the Lorraine Motel. Um, according to the uh, head firefighter, military intelligence was allowed to come in and set up on the top of that roof. And it appears that they were there to do recording. Other evidence indicates that the gun that was given to Jowers was provided by mafia. And this is not to say that the mafia had any motive in killing King, but other than if they were the ones that did the shot, that's called plausible deniability. Because then if it gets traced back to the government, the government said, we didn't do it. You know what I mean? So this is just some of it. And uh, clearly it indicates a state order, an execution at the highest level. And they wanted to be sure that King did not survive that. And there were a lot of other things, but I think uh, these were essential things. There's a couple other things that, that, that's important. Um, the um, alleged assassin, James Earl Ray, was supposed to have had a white Mustang. And this white Mustang was supposed to have been the vehicle that he arrived uh, in and he escaped, you know, after doing the shooting in. Now, there was a lady who lived very close to the Lorraine Motel. She heard the shot. And when she came out, you know, she made observation and nobody ever interviewed her. And one of the things she observed was this white Mustang. Now, others observed the fact that he had actually left the scene before the assassination. He said he had car trouble. He had to deal with some repairs on his car. But the license plate that was observed on the white Mustang that this woman saw was not the same license plate as on James Earl Ray's car. So he was clearly a patsy. And it appears set up by others who had been working for the intelligence agencies, but who had mob connections uh, as well. So. This is, this is all indication of what we should know, but now more data has come out on this. So um, in your research, what was the FBI's role beyond uh, maneuvering him to the motel? Do you see any other role of the FBI in the assassination? Yeah, I think that's, that, that's an important thing to put in context. And, you know, to answer that question, I just want to show a couple of slides because there's people who uh, who wouldn't, with the details of how his assassination was orchestrated, the, the context of it, because most people are very uninformed about King's role and the concern of not only the, the government, the FBI, but the white public. What's amazing is the white public, the vast majority of white folks, not all, but there was a vast number who... They never called him Martin Luther King, by the way, it was always Martin Luther Kuhn. They never mentioned his last name. And you can see all of the letters sent in by regular citizens to the FBI, thinking that anything could probably help to take, take him down because the media was attacking King. And so as we were uh, discussing, I just want to share, just show this in order to really put in context, you know, the FBI, um, role because it's if 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 we don't look at the second period of king's political work when he focused exclusively on human rights 
and start dealing with these other issues. This is when the FBI's campaign was increased against Dr. King, when he's dealing with an a, a unrelenting attack on the structural problems he embraces, as we said earlier, about uh, embracing black power. But he's talking increasingly about a revolutionary movement that would transform the country in the same way that the US became an independent country from the 13 American colonies became independent through a bloody struggle. And King said that our that we have to recognize that the black nations have to go through the same extremism and violence that formed our country. And he always made a connection, intimate connection between the African liberation movement and, and the, the movement here in the US. But it's the second period that really concerned the government. And while the, and that's why their mm -hmm. attack on King became more intensified. So we have to look at the fact he's focused on human rights uh, and black power. And so the FBI and then, and so there's a lot of evidence about what he's doing in those latter uh, years and latter months. We already mentioned the Poor People's Campaign and, um, and what they were focused on, but it is the FBI and their Get King campaign. So any review of the media reports will see that J. Edgar Hoover was absolutely, he was driven. He, this was a madman who was focused on taking down King. And so he called him a notorious liar. He said King was one of the lowest types in the country and the whole FBI was poisoned with this vicious uh, campaign to destroy Dr. King. And so they were adamant on it. This is part of a letter, for example, that they mailed to uh, try to get the man to commit suicide. And if King was not gonna commit suicide, the, the FBI made it very clear that they were gonna do something about it. And these are the actual records where uh, they're saying that this man is he's immoral, he's vicious, he, uh, he needs to commit suicide, he knows what needs to be done, he needs to take himself out. And they sent with this letter a tape to try to break up his family, none of it worked. It just entrenched King in his work, but uh, uh, this is important. So all of what um, you, know, you were sharing, the intimate details of what led up to the scenario for King's assassination is clearly it was the primary work of the FBI that had other government agencies involved, including the National um, uh, Security Agency as well. The NSA is just as involved as the other agencies as well. So this is really, is this is the main campaign. So everybody was pressed into service to find a way to take King down, uh, whether it's um, people infiltrating his organization famous uh, photographer like Ernest Withers, or even um, even the invaders. These were young, these were gang members in Memphis. Even they were organized to break up the demonstration. So this is what the FBI, so the FBI was the point organization within the government to really set up King's assassination. And, um, and that's very clear about what they've done. And all these different reports in the 1970s about what happened and, and blaming James Earl Ray, a petty criminal. You're right, he's a patsy that's been very clear. They set him up uh, to be the fall guy. He admitted it first, but then within a few days, he said that he was told to say he committed the assassination when within several days, he recanted that. And uh, he recanted that and he later wrote a book. And there was a, even a, um, I believe it was HBO. They even had a, a lot of these people that were still around and still alive. They did their own mock trial and said that there's no logical conclusion that could be made that James Earl Ray was the so-called lone gunman when we look at all of these elements. But it's to really know that King's political work is why they targeted him for assassination. Anybody that thinks that he's just committed to nonviolence and, and he was... Um, you know, focus on integration and making the government and the white public comfortable. This has nothing to do with Dr. King, who talked about the triple evils of uh, racism, militarism, and and poverty, and he was relentless in his criticism. So these, and one thing we should know too, are all these different these these uh, committees co committee reports on assassination. They were all orchestrated and controlled by white men all of them. So they're tainted, tainted from the beginning. They all have an interest to say that it was a lone gunman 
in, in the case of Dr. King. Nobody around King believes that. They know it makes no sense, including the reporter Earl Caldwell, who was never interviewed and the man was there to report on what was happening. But they were able to co-opt a lot of people in this campaign and the Freedom of Information Act made it available for the COINTELPRO documents to be produced and made available to the public. And those documents make it very clear when they wanted to neutralize uh, the threat of a potential, as they called it, a black messiah who could electrify and unify the masses of black people. And they mentioned Dr. King and his name has been retracted from the document. But if you kind of look at what names would have been there, it would have been King, Malcolm and a few other people, Stokely Carmichael, but King's name was in there in the original document. His name was uh, uh, redacted, but it fits nicely and neatly into this process. So that's what it is. And so uh, I think we got a lot of a lot of uh, work to do. If people think that those people who are now talking about King's legacy, this is bogus. It's not King's legacy. All those people talking about the dream and all. he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about a nightmare. In fact, one of his last sermons was unfulfilled dreams. In fact, after he gave the I have a dream speech, he started talking about the American nightmare. He said that after I talked about the dream in, in less than a month, four girls were, were killed in Birmingham, he starts to talk about all of these issues which made it an American nightmare. So I think that's the larger context which we should look at in order to understand why would there be such a concern to eliminate and assassinate Dr. King. That's an important point that you're making uh, there in terms of how um, the various writers, the media and everything else has lined up to distort uh, King's real legacy uh, which is the same thing they did with Malcolm, because um, what you see with King is always the emphasis on the I have a dream speech. And that becomes like the uh, supposed example of where King was going. And uh, then you'll have people in high office, including our first black president, uh, talking about King out of context in terms of his militancy, but not talking about the radicalness of King and the same thing uh, with Malcolm. So I think that's important. One of the things that I found interesting was that by the end of their lives, King and Malcolm had reached nearly the same identical point. That is, they had both become revolutionaries. And in fact, they were exchanging uh, information through uh, King's attorney. King's attorney was relaying information that Malcolm had to King and vice versa uh, from King to Malcolm. So um, what do you think of this correspondence that you end up with where King and Malcolm seem to end up in the same place? What do you, do you agree with that? And if so, um, what's the meaning of that historically for us today? I think it's, it's crucial, Doc. I mean, you know, as you know, because people have this false idea of a dichotomy between Malcolm and King, you know, they think about a, a Muslim and a Christian and one focus on inter, uh, separation and integration and one's focused in the North, the other one's the South, one, you know, all of this other kind of uh, these dichotomies, you know, self-defense versus nonviolence, when in fact, those uh, those are superficial analyses, and besides, they both have more than one period in their in their in their political work. We can look at Malcolm in four different phases. You know, uh, we can uh, from Malcolm Malcolm Little to Detroit Red, Malcolm X, El Hashemik, Malik El Shabazz. Particularly that last phase from 64 65, he's no longer, as he said, in a straitjacket. He goes to Selma, Alabama. In, uh, in February of 65, before he's assassinated, to meet with Dr. King and offer his support. And King also was changing as well. He recognized the civil rights bill had been passed in 64. So when Malcolm goes in early 65 to meet with King and to offer his unconditional support, just three, two and a half weeks before Malcolm was assassinated, this was very significant. It's clear that they had more in common than they had in conflict, and they, they knew that. King was able to work with and unify people from different organizations, slightly different perspectives. He said, you know, unity doesn't mean uniformity, doesn't mean we agree on every single 
item. And they didn't have to in order to move forward. And, and Malcolm admired King and others because of their courage, their courageousness. Anybody can see progress being made. And for some people in the public today to talk, oh, well, it's not a revolutionary. They only wanted to do this and that. That's silly. Uh, Malcolm and nobody else picked up a gun and, and organized an, an army. He just he asserted the principle that we would defend ourselves. So did King. And I think they both were very clear that they had a lot in common. And Malcolm favored the fact that we should be able to have political rights. And he said that he was supporting King. And that's why he went to Selma to do just that. So it was just a matter of time before these men would be working collaboratively. And got, Malcolm always wanted to work with, despite what the public hears about Malcolm's criticism, he always wanted to work with the, the uh, so-called civil rights leaders in the early 60s. But Ella Baker said, don't be naive. You're not going to work with these these people. He said you can maybe work with the more progressive among them, and and she was directing Malcolm that some of these people you're not going to be able to work with. And King recognized the same thing that these conservative folks who did want to not only integrate, they wanted to amalgamate. These people wanted to engage in <laughs> in sexual integration, so that as as, as someone who said, so nobody will be as dark as I am in the next generation or two. <laughs> what <laughs> crazy nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> you know, King, didn't, <laughs> King didn't agree with this nonsense, and clearly Malcolm didn't either. So the government was very clear as they followed both of these men that uh, this kind of convergence couldn't take place. And, you know, it's, it's the difference between rhetoric and outside nonsense, nonsensical ideas versus people that are in the struggle, who are active, who understand what's happening, and who don't have a propaganda angle to create this dichotomy that doesn't really exist in reality. I mean, just like, you know, people can criticize Booker T. Washington. Oh, he's the so-called Uncle Tom. He didn't say anything against lynching. Uh, what are you talking about? Booker T. Washington took $600,000 from Andrew Carnegie and others in 1903 to help the Tuskegee Institute because they liked the fact that Booker T. did not say anything publicly against Jim Crow lynching. And what does he do? He takes the 600000 and he gives them a, a, a lot of that to the anti-slavery activists <laughs> as a strategy. So these men, you know, they were working and they were definitely coming together and they certainly had a lot in common. And Malcolm and King were both clear. King was more clear first that you gotta go through different steps. You can't just state principles and what are you gonna do, just start picking up a gun fighting? You know, King's, King, King made it very clear that the civil rights of the first period was simply a strategy so that the government and the police, as he said, can't beat black folks up legally, <laughs> that at least they have on the books, that black folks have the humanity, and at least on paper, the citizenship, that they can go into hotel, motels, restaurants, and any other public facility, and that they can vote. That's what he wanted, to have that on the books as a, a tool uh, and a weapon, so that as they press forward with their struggle, at least that they would be on the right side of the law. He wasn't limited to that, you know, King wasn't. He said that laws declare rights, but they don't deliver the rights that people themselves have to go out and act. And I think, uh, you know, from what I've seen, Malcolm had the utmost respect for that because uh, the nation wasn't out in the streets organizing. I mean, they did good work and we must honor the nation of Islam for his work, but they weren't in the forefront of the struggle at all. And Malcolm always wanted to be, and Ella Baker kind of cautioned him, plus, uh, you know, the nation just didn't have that as a position to be leading demonstrate. They, their position was that if you are in a demonstration and you get your head knocked in, then you should get your behind handed to you. You shouldn't be out there in the first place. Really? That's the position? <laughs> so, so Malcolm grew beyond the rhetoric and recognized that this is a necessary part of our struggle, you know, for true freedom in the country. And King was not just focused on being equal to white folks. That was, he looked at it beyond that. He's talking about asserting our humanity. And Malcolm, you know, had some respect for that. They didn't have to agree on every single item, but they certainly had a whole lot in conflict. And that meeting down there in Selma around the first few days in March of 65 was more than what the government was going to stand for. And I, so it was not an accident at all that two and a half weeks later, Malcolm was assassinated. Yeah, those are good points. And I think that one of the most important things about King and Malcolm ending up in virtually the same place, both of them talking about restructuring uh, this country. 
Uh, King talked about it, as you point out, in the second period. And Malcolm, as I pointed out before, com compared it in, in one of his analogies, a chicken and a duck egg. America wasn't designed to produce freedom no more than a chicken was designed to produce a duck egg. But the point is, in his travels in Africa, he was looking at uh, countries that were trying to do some radical transformation for the benefit of the people. He was looking at Julius Nereri in Tanzania, who had one of the best programs for economic development for the Wananchi, which is Swahili word for everyday people. So Malcolm uh, had, had reached that point. And, and historically, what's important about that is historically, uh, Harold Cruz, on his book, Crisis of the Negro Intellectual, thing that made his book a classic was that he, he identified two streams in Black struggle, political struggle in this country, one for integration, one for Black nationalism, generally separation. Mm -hmm. And it manifested in the form of either returning to Africa, or some had the idea of separate states in the South. And so that's real. I mean, that, that's a historical a reality for our people. And, and then, you know, he traced it to the roots of slavery and how the integrationist wing tended to come from the house and so forth. But the key point is this, when not only Malcolm and King reach agreement, but a significant sector of the radical sector of the black freedom movement, what becomes the black power movement, what later becomes a Pan-Africanist movement, reach similar conclusions. This is not the majority. And Asante Shakur reaches similar conclusions. A lot of people in the Black Panther Party reach similar conclusions. I would assume that some in Black Lives Matter have reached similar conclusions. And, and so, you know, I think that the most important thing about this radicalization or the revolutionary posture that both King and Malcolm take is that it is the beginning of reconciling these two tendencies because really the majority of black people are not gonna be able to go back to Africa. And I think if you wanna get realistic about it, <laughs> this idea of a separate state, and I know I'm gonna step on a few people's toes on this, but guess what? White people tried that and what, what did it lead to a civil war? Now, if right. white people are gonna fight over the southern half separating and they were not fighting over our freedom, they just wanted to maintain this United States of America as an economic political engine, what you think they're gonna do if you just want Mississippi? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same thing you're gonna do if you want the whole country. So the reality is I think that King and Malcolm were just the tip of the iceberg of a deep reflection that had gone on in our movement and had taken some time to reach because this is not a place where blacks alone are gonna be able to produce this. This is where King's point about allies and stuff is real. But you gotta be careful about who your allies are and you gotta be careful about who's in charge of whatever you're doing. So uh, that point, you know, I think is uh, really important that both of them had reached the same conclusion. And that's one reason why King became a threat in the nation of Islam, because conservative forces didn't like the fact that he'd be upset in the government, bring the pressure of the government down on their heads, which is also understandable. Because yeah, it probably would. <laughs> so I understand that concern. But uh, Mal Malcolm was upsetting things on other levels like corruption, materialism, and a whole bunch of other stuff, which was another thing they had in common. Neither one valued materialism. And in, in fact, both had material inclinations, materialistic inclinations. I mean, if you look at King, when he was first in college, you know, look at his appearance and everything, uh, Malcolm on the streets, you know what I mean? But the point is the people became first and, and they began to discard that materialism. King didn't even want to have a house and Malcolm didn't, want to put it in his name. And it was a modest house, big mistake. <laughs> but the key point is, as King, as Malcolm said, 
if you get wrapped up in materialism, you forget about your people. That was King's view as well. And that is the real area of co-optation. Women is one, money is the key, and ego. I mean, if they can get to any one of these with you, especially leadership, they take you out. But that material one, that's the big one because that is the one that takes anyone out that goes that route. They'll do almost anything for the money. So they were on the same page. Now, you, you, know, you made another comment that, that led me to think of another question. And you, know, you were talking about, and you did this before uh, two weeks ago, you were talking about uh, King not buying into the values of the system. And on the one hand, you were talking about, well, he's not an integrationist. But King also began to talk about uh, new values. And, and, you know, I thought that was important. Could you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. You know, in, uh, in 67 is when he really begins to, to say to hell with it. You know what? I got to take this to the next level. So he was, in 67, for Dr. King, he was less concerned about the response of fellow, fellow civil rights leaders who were much more conservative than he ever was. You know, these people were just, they wanted to just keep it within a certain realm. You know, King said, you know what, I'm not bound and limited by any of this. So King, after he receives the Nobel Peace Prize in 64, it's clear that he's now discussing the fact that there's something wrong with the U.S. economic system. He begins to discuss it. But in 67 is when he decided to take all the gloves off and engage in an all-out assault on the American system. And he said there had to be a radical redistribution of wealth, a radical change in the American values. He said that the American capitalist system is bankrupt. He starts questioning whether or not people, why, why people should pay a water bill. He said, if the earth is two thirds or three fourths water, why do we have to pay a water bill? He said he didn't see the homeless and the poverty when he was in uh, Scandinavia receiving the award. And he comes back and he's criticizing specifically the values of the American system that led to the capitalist structure. And then and he says that the system demands that it has the poor and the slum dwellers. He said, but if you have the poor, you have the ultra rich at the same time that these are two realities within the American system. So much so, you know, him by him being very savvy and then having advisors around him, they said, well, they're already call, calling you a communist. So, you know, we have to we have to anticipate that this would lead towards more attacks and, and to try to box you in. So then King start calling himself a not a socialist, but a socialized Democrat in 67 and 68, because he understood that his increased attacks on the American system would be more uh, uh, counterattacks by the media, by politicians. And a lot of mayors gave him keys to the city cities in those early days, early years, but not after not after 65. They took away those keys to the city. You're not welcome anymore. And so he always talked about a radical, in the second period, a radical revolution of values in the country, meaning that a, he said that one thing that King would say, for example, that a country, um, you know, that increasingly is concerned about material wealth is, is approaching spiritual death. And he always would say this, that flinging a coin, a coin to a beggar, um, he said that, that, um, uh, that true compassion is not flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice or government that produces beggars needs restructuring. And he, he articulated that a number of times. It's not just flinging a coin out of disrespect to a homeless person, but it is the structure that produces the beggar. And if anybody does not look at, if anybody looks at that, they'll recognize that this is an, an indictment of the American value system and the economic structure. And that value system also had him condemning materialism and um, the extreme materialism as well. And this is very clear and it's upsetting to the government and to the whole economic structure. And then King, on the other hand, he would criticize communism as well as being just, you know, a system creating people to be nothing more than a cog in a wheel, that there's no individual 
freedom to think. And, and so he criticized both systems, but he is hard on American capitalism. And so 67 is a tremendous tra uh, turning point. And that's why we have to look at that year. We can look at specific markers, like for example, the last, uh, the speech he gave, as I said, beyond Vietnam, April 4th, 67, exactly one year to the day of his assassination, that should be looked at. We should look at one of his last critical speeches, like remaining awake during a great revolution. This was on March 31st of 68, just several days before the assassination. And so that great revolution that he talked about was, was a revolution of values that he emphasized. And he also emphasized a revolution in human rights. And these are many different aspects of King's unswerving indictment of the American political and economic system that was, was created by the American values that he was absolutely in condemnation of. That point you make about um, Baker and um, charity and how that ain't enough. That's a real important point because this is a society that gives very little to the poor, virtually nothing. In fact, this um, infrastructure plan that Biden has is a real first attempt at that uh, since uh, Roosevelt, you know what I mean? And it's not funded nearly at the level it should be, but it's two trillion. That's more than has been done up to now. But tax breaks are given to the rich that is, is equal or greater than that. So King's emphasis on restructuring. I don't know if people who are listening really get what that means. <laughs> you know what I mean, because it means, for example, we know racism structured into the society. So in every institution, when COVID-19 goes down, it's structured so you're gonna die more. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't even have to have anybody plan it. And then you have a hater like uh, Trump in the White House, you know, he's mandating everything, which is nothing. He's doing nothing. So it guarantees your death rate is going up, but it already was high because of the way it's structured. And so the way an economy that's structured around capitalism is structured, it's structured so almost all the goodies go to the top and hardly nothing goes to the middle or the bottom. It's structured that way. The country was founded on that. The founding fathers that, that held the Constitutional Convention, they held 50% of the wealth of the country. The Constitution is designed to see that that is maintained. And that's also when King goes beyond the Constitution, because what the Constitution does is talk about rights. And of course, they didn't apply to us. Mm -hmm. But even what they granted to whites amounted to very little. But there's no powers. There's no power to have anything, you know, to have a job. There's no right or power to um, a roof over your head and a good roof over your head. Uh, you know, so, so restructuring is, is about coming up with a whole different idea of how a society should work. And so he was just beginning to think that, and what he was looking at is basically Western models. But there's the African model. Mm -hmm. And that's the African model that we couldn't practice full blown here, which is communal, sharing the air, land, and water. We couldn't practice it um, fully because of private property. But we did in terms of ethos, that is looking out for each other, sharing. You know what I mean? That, that's how we survived. So in, in looking at restructuring, I would say one of the things we need to look at are the just societies anywhere in the world, but especially Africa, because Africa maintained a communal order for most of its existence and in the rural areas today still maintain it. And built into it is also democracy. And that's one of the problems that the left has when they end up in power, it seems like a few people end up wielding everything. Yeah, and, and, Go ahead. And, and, and to make your point there, Doc, is that you're right. Um, people have to recognize as well that King was a veteran, uh, he's a veteran leader in the forefront of the struggle, but he's still young in terms of just years, you know, age. He's only in his 30s. 
And so um, his understanding, like other real activists, was continuously evolving with the times. And what the media has done and biographers and, and uninformed people in the public perpetuate this nonsense, they freeze King in some, I had a dream, they freeze him in this concept as if this is all it. And they haven't even read that speech. He's mm -hmm. condemning the enemy in the speech and right. the brutality in the speech and vicious racist in Alabama in the speech. They leave out all that. But in 66, when he and his group moves the campaign to Chicago, he lays out a fundamental change and shift in the country. And so all these people running around talking about who's a revolutionary, who's not, uh, who's going to pick up a gun and deal with these white. The King said, look, you need to be realistic because they got the, uh, you know, the white majority. They got the, the military, the army, the police, an extreme right wing that would exterminate. This is what he's that would delight in exterminating every black man, woman, and child. And uh, that's what he said. So you need to be realistic and count the bodies. But for him, we're going to solve the problem. Let's see if nonviolence works. King said, I don't know if it will work or not. He said, I engaged in an experiment to see if nonviolence can solve the problems in America. And you know what? 67, he's not clear. He said, I don't know. Maybe it works. Maybe it's not. Maybe it won't it work. We don't know. I just engaged in the truth seeking process to find out. But he was increasingly concerned that we ain't got no victories in nonviolence. I can't make an argument that it works. So that's why he called the poor people's campaign the last desperate attempt for nonviolence. He made it very clear. Give us a few months in D.C. to try to shut the government down and make them give a bill of rights for the disadvantaged in the billions. Oh, and by the way, there's cities doing that right now with the guaranteed income. We got Stockton, California, San Francisco. Uh, there's Oakland and other cities now guaranteed income because of the right wing propaganda that you, you want to give COVID benefits to these uh, lazy, poor people. And all they're going to do is now stay home and not work. And people said, no, that's not the issue at all. The structure itself puts people in poverty and these guaranteed income, you know, it'd be like, so it depends on the program, six months guaranteed income, in other words, $500 uh, for six months or a thousand dollars for you, whatever it is in the different cities, do what you want to with the money, no stipulations. And they found like in Stockton, California found that the people use that money in a way that's very constructive. Some just needed, don't, look, don't give us food stamps. That's not the issue. <clears throat> some cases we just need to get our car fixed to be able to go to job interviews. In some cases, I just need a babysitter. That's it. So I can work. And they found that these people were far more productive in being able to get more jobs uh, at a higher rate or jobs that are paying more than those that didn't get the guaranteed income. King had been arguing that for years, but in Chicago, he lays out the whole infrastructure that needs to be changed from education to real estate, banks and mortgage, slum, uh, he, he condemned slum lords, as he called them. He talked, of course, about the police, the federal, federal housing agencies. He goes through a whole list of federal government, the city government, the whole political system. There's nothing that King is not indicting and criticizing <laughs> in January of 1966, when he begins to deal with what he called the basic issue of human rights. And to not know that means that people are uninformed and they can then try to lock King into some phony position that he does not hold. All they had to do was read what he said, what he wrote, and, and, and read his last book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, to see that there's a comprehensive approach to dealing with a radical restructuring of the country. And um, so Malcolm agreed with that. Every progressive person agreed with it and nobody, I, you were emphasizing this last, last um, a couple of weeks ago, who, nobody had all the answers. It's a dynamic fluid situation. It's an ebb and flow. Yes, there's a civil rights and human rights movement, but then there's the counter conservative movement as well. It's not like we're just moving forward without opposition. So it's dynamic. And we figure, you know, activists are figuring out what's the counter move. This is a chessboard situation. You know, that you make a move and you understand that uh, the enemy is going to make a move. You got to think ahead. And King was a, he, he was a, someone who could understand. And he's always literally projecting for those around him what to expect and what, un, what, to, what is there to understand. And he said, look, he, he, he explains the struggle like when you're winding in a mountain area, you know, you wind down the mountain and there's sometimes you cannot see the goal at the end. 
you know, as you're winding down. And he's explaining to him that don't be discouraged. Our course is a good one. But his condemnation did not sway of every aspect of the society. And somebody uh, attempt to find a speech by King where he's not condemning the dirty white supremacists. He always condemns them. He says that racism is as native, is as native to America as the pine trees, the sagebrush, and, and the buff, buffalo grass. He's so it's so embedded in the American system that it lightly burdens the conscience. Mm -hmm. He's always condemning these people, and uh, and he's unswerving in doing so. So that's that's what I wanted to share to really enhance the point that you were just making. Uh, why do you consider it more important to focus on King's death day than his birthday? Yeah, that's one of the critical ones. I think Christians could could uh, understand it. You know, they look at Jesus's, you know, Jesus was hung on the cross or some text says hung in a tree, but he is, you know, crucified. Uh, and the Christians focus on that in order to really emphasize the importance of Jesus's life. So his death day is more important than Jesus's birthday. The same with King. There's nothing unusual about a young black boy being born in Atlanta in uh, 19, uh, you know, 29. There's nothing unusual about that. There's nothing threatening, nothing in, in necessarily important. But what he lived for and what he ultimately died for is why Dr. King has become important. While we, even in the 21st century, are still talking about his significance and making sure that everybody has a much better understanding of the revolutionary Dr. King. So it's his principal life that he lived, a life, the life of a man who was committed to a mission that was bigger than him. Like I, I understood King, you know, it really helped me out a lot to figure out that when you have a mission in life, you don't choose the mission, the mission chooses you. And King made that very clear. He, he didn't go to school and seminary and theology school just to become to become an active revolutionary. He, he wanted to live a simple life, minister, preacher, raise a family, and that's the end of it. And he even says that, that it took him years to really recognize the role that he had, you know, a particular role. But his life and death is the more important aspect of King's life and not simply focusing on his January 15th birthday, but the the April 4th assassination raises a whole bunch of questions. If this is a man who's just committed to nonviolence, the so-called Prince of Peace, somebody who is a um, so-called pacifist, if all of that's true, it makes no sense whatsoever. The white, the white, <clears throat> the white nationalist, the segregationist, the white supremacist, they would do everything they can if if he had been shot to resuscitate and revive such a man and use him to further their ends. But the opposite is true. This is the man that they were most concerned about, much more than, and the records are clear. He was the number one threat because of his influence, because of his principled stance, and, uh, and they couldn't move him away from his position. But to be able to influence that number of people and not be co-opted when the US, when the FBI tried to throw money at him and get him to start lecturing for rights rather than to demonstrate and demand them, they knew that, damn, we got somebody here that's very, very dangerous. But the death day raises all of these questions as to why the government agencies would want a man like that dead if he's just talking about peace, nonviolence, and integration. It makes no sense whatsoever. But when we look at what we've been looking at today, and the uh, you know the the different agencies in the government who wanted him dead, then uh, it raises a whole bunch of questions of why it is where that he's the most surveillance man in the history of the country. Why would they have so many agents in this organization and wiretap all of the phones and and uh, have microphones everywhere? Why would they try to break up his family? Why did they try to commit him get him to commit suicide? Uh, what was this about? They recognized that this man was challenging the very foundation of the American system. And any naive person who thinks otherwise, then you know what? Stop spreading misinformation about King. Read something. People have an opinion, but where's the evidence? Documentation beats conversation. You know, and I, you know what I, what I decided to do, Doc, uh, the reason why I decided to do the primary work on King, I recognized that nearly everybody would have an opinion about King. And I didn't want to be just talking like most people about things that they don't know nothing about other than what they heard or some Mickey Mouse source 
online that they might have read, you know, from Mrs. Johnson's kindergarten class commenting on it. I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to look at the details and find out what are the issues because if people read what he had to say or even listen at doc, any of his speeches, like a uh, testament of hope or remaining awake during a great revolution, they recognized it. Wow. They wouldn't even know who it is, first of all. If you don't, if you just take the label off, listen to this, they, they wouldn't know. They would not know that that is Dr. King. And that's what was shocking to me. And that's when I recognized the man, I have to focus on his assassination, find out why. And I was able to, to really see those FBI documents and then look at these studies after his assassination about uh, what was the government's conclusion, recognizing that they're illogical, just like David Garrell. How in the world do you chronicle from 62 to 68, the greatest single illegal campaign against a, a US citizen, the FBI's campaign to get King and then conclude that the FBI and the government somehow had no, no role in his assassination when you yourself document that they had all of, of the incentives to take the man down. So, so I think the public would do well to follow the lead that, that, that we are forging. And I'm glad you invited me in April to, to, to shift to the death day and not place as much emphasis on the birthday in January. Yeah, well, you informed people with a lot of information that people don't have, but the main one that I hope people get is that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was a revolutionary. That's the main one. And that is the one that has been distorted to death. Most of us don't appreciate that. Some do, most of us do not. Uh, with the assassination of King, uh, what was the immediate aftermath throughout the country after King's assassination on April the 4th, 1968? What was the reaction? Man, people saw uh, whatever the media has been calling 2020, the summer of, uh, what do they call it? The summer of disruption or whatever their term is, summer of 2020, they ain't got nothing on, uh, on the, the spring and summer of 1968. So when the King was assassinated, there were hundreds of cities on fire across America. You know, they're gonna kill Dr. King. If they're gonna take out the so-called Prince of Peace, if they're gonna take out the man that is the so-called pacifist, then what do we have to lose? It, it had the same kind of, you know, uh, people were motivated just like when they saw the body of Emmett Till back in August of 55. That, so it's not an accident that this led to a powerful it, Montgomery bus boycott, and then that spread from there. But, but the cities were on fire across America. And that they, there had been urban rebellions before that, in the mid '60s, um, for sure. But '68 was a was a particular summer. So there were rebellions all over the country. And the Kerner Commission report, the Kerner Commission came together in 1968. Otto Kerner was the governor of Ohio, and they wanted to find out why were there rebellions all over the country. And it wasn't just when King was assassinated, that's when it took off to a different level, but it was all these other years, 67 and 66 and 65, black folks were rising up in urban rebellions all over the country, but they wanted to know what was it about. And the Kerner Commission results were very interesting. This is why I tell young people that, that it ain't nothing new that we're dealing with now. You need to read and understand the continuum of black folks of all, every generation has to step up. But the Kerner Commission in 68 is very important because the, re the results were this, that there were urban rebellions all across the country. And they said that the spark, the immediate spark in every case was police action. They didn't say police brutality in every issue, but police action. You know, sometimes it was police brutality, sometimes it was police murder, sometimes it was just the police coming in to to deal with the situation and they were a little bit too rough or they had too many people involved. And it seemed like, you know, the person wasn't getting that they were engaged in street justice, um, for example. So like um, always police action, like in Chicago, there was uh, several days of rebellions in Chicago and um, because the young people in the summer, they turned on the fire hydrant, you know, because they didn't have any, any swimming pools. The community had been arguing for swimming pools for years. Um, Chicago gets hot. And uh, so they turn on the fire hydrant, the police come and say and turn it off. And then they want to uh, cause a scene. The people come and say, look, you, if you're going to arrest somebody, then treat them respectfully. And the police calls for backup. And they say, you know, 
they have to, it's three days of uprising in Chicago and uh, they have to call in the National Guard, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and then end up at the end of all of it, end up building a swimming pool. Well, that's what they were arguing in the first place, build a swimming pool. So it was always police action. And the Colonel Commission report also said this, that the underlying causes of this was uh, white racism, poverty, unemployment, that these were the issues that led to the depressed conditions. So when the police came in as occupiers, roughing up somebody, disrespecting people as outsiders, and then was just the spark. So the Kerner Commission was very clear that these were the issues. Of course, they didn't do anything about it, but they did pinpoint what led to these uprisings. And it was the immediate, in 68, they were the immediate uh, result of the 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 uh, assassination of Dr. King in, on April 4th of 68, and then the hundreds of cities on fire, literally. So the summer of 2020, it ain't nothing new at all. We've seen it uh, in different times, whether it's Liberty City in Miami, whether it's the King, Rodney King verdict in uh, 91, but the 68, I mean, that's huge in the history of uh, rising up against the white supremacist state that would just come in and think they can do what they want, when they want, the way they want to do it to the black community. So people are not beast. They're going to rise. I used to say they're not animals, but animals will rise up too, as we see when they're treated unjustly. But people do rise up, and uh, but that, those commissions on civil disorder, I think, uh, have been very insightful about the problem in America. And then they didn't address it, just a bunch of superficial approaches, but they had to do something because uh, uh, people understood this was a loss. This was a big loss for Black people in the Black community for these vicious racists to take out Dr. King. Um, yeah, and the urban rebellions, a lot of people call them riots, incorrect people who are rebelling against oppression. Um, King, I think, understood it. And, and he made the comment that Blacks in the North were facing rising expectations that um, gains had been made in the South around voting and desegregation. And Blacks in the North expected some changes would come that would benefit them. And they didn't. And so that, that fueled the fire. And you know, I think that uh, he was right on that. There were very few Northern areas that addressed the fundamental issue of the North, which was economic. San Francisco freedom movements, the only one that effectively addressed it, the only one, effectively. There were movements that addressed it piecemeal, usually construction site demonstrations and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that was the, you know, that was the people making a loud and clear statement. We're frozen out. <laughs> Got us locked in these areas where there's nothing, you know, literally nothing. And so they were fighting back. And as you point out, always police violence, which is the same thing now that's spurring uh, the movements right now. So as we wrap up, um, any final things you want to say about what you see as uh, King's legacy in terms of uh, the example, the, the programmatic uh, thrust, his organizational approach, his um, ethical commitment that has uh, any application to today. What are a few things that you would sum up uh, that we can draw from King's life that's applicable to today? Yeah, that, I think that's the critical part of it because you know what happens is that every January 15th or, or thereabout that Monday close to his holiday people uh, will talk about you know that the goal is to live the dream well, what dream they came to find what dream are you talking about so it's superficial it's abstract and uh, there's nothing to move on but King does lay out a, a plan he lays out a plan in his book where do we go from here he deals with all of these important arenas. How do how do you deal with the grinding poverty in America? How do you deal with this um, class issue, which is a tremendous rift between the extreme rich and the poor? He addresses that, that there has to be a restructuring. He says there should be guaranteed income, guaranteed jobs, and that this should be in the billions. Anybody that can work should be allowed to work. And, and so this guaranteed income now, as I mentioned earlier, this is what's being done now to show that this does help people. 
And so uh, King laid that out. He mentions um, strengthening labor unions and having relationships with labor unions. He mentions, uh, he has a whole section on black power, you know, um, and, and what, how black power or the power for uh, giving the black people in the communities needs to operate in, in the labor arena, the economic arena, the political arena. And that's when he, he's working with Native American activists. He's working with um, uh, the Chicano movement activists. And on his last birthday, he met with Cesar Chavez and others to strategize as they were talking about the Poor People's Campaign and really to create jobs and, a, as he would say, an economic floor for the different groups of people. He also said that the problem is that there was not a good approach and an honest approach to deal with poverty. He said there's a war in Vietnam where the U.S. is spending hundreds of millions of dollars to go kill people abroad. He says a war abroad, but not even a good skirmish, not even a good skirmish against poverty in the U.S. And so he said this is hypocritical. You talk about military advisors abroad, he's spending all his time and resources, but there's no resources in, in, the, in, in these depressed communities. Uh, ghettos and uh, the teeming ghettos as he explained it so his legacy or his work and focus was to invest heavily into these um, under-resourced communities that that uh where people were poor they were unemployed they had no jobs no income and the government need to uh as he would say take care of the least of these so for him it is to address every aspect of the corruption and the criminality and the white supremacy that he condemned from the job market, housing uh, market, police, local government, federal government. There's no aspect that King does not criticize. He, he does not praise any aspect of the, of the country. You don't see him praising any aspect that, hey, you know, I think we're doing well here. No, it's a, it's a condemnation of every aspect of the society. And I think if we look at that, we'll see it's a comprehensive approach that makes sense. He's talking about police, dealing with police violence and police reform, radical reform, even then, you know, to deal with the, the brutality of the police. And so um, I think that if we look at his, his work, where do we go from here? That's that, I mean, he, he wrote different things, but that's probably the most comprehensive evaluation of the problem and what he believes would be the direction of a solution you know that that could be uh, uh, handled so it's important to read what he had to say what he wrote his speeches his sermons his press statements to really understand his position and not the distortion where people will start talking about a dream he ain't talking about no dream in 67 and 68 he's talking about the nightmare that took place that he did say in um, his last sermon, you know, his la you know, one of his last sermons, Unfulfilled Dreams, he said that life is a continual story of shattered dreams. And so he recognized that uh, this was part of what was happening. So he's a practical person and his works and his writings clearly indicate that. So that's what I would say, then people be on the right track to know what King was about. And it would explain why it is he became an uncomfortable symbol to the US government when he condemned them for their vicious practices at home and abroad. And so that's what I would say is, is uh, his legacy and that has now been distorted because people don't know what it is. And so it's easy to talk about a dream today because they thought that's what he was about when that's not about. And I just one other thing to show you the distortions and what we have to guard against is that I remember in Baltimore when I was there, uh, right around the time I was working on my, my primary research with Dr. King, one of the teachers at one of the schools said they had a project. All of the third graders, graders were to draw a picture of Dr. King. And one of the young girls drew a picture of Dr. King lying in bed. He said, baby, why did you draw a picture of him lying in bed? So she said, well, he had a dream. So I thought he must have been asleep. She said, wow, here you got one of the greatest activists in the 20th century been reduced to nothing more than a dreamer. And that third grader clearly understands how his legacy has been presented. So we have to take his legacy back by shifting from the birthday to the death day and all of the work that led to his assassination. And we will be stunned if we really look at the king, the man and not continue
to allow people to present King the myth. So that's what I would, that's, that's what I would say. Right on. Just a few final things, and then we'll get to a few of the questions that uh, people have raised or comments that they've raised. Uh, as you said, if King, uh, King was living now, uh, I'm 81, he'd be 91. He was 10 years older than me. Um, he would have some ideas that would have developed over a fair amount of time. And so one of the things that's happened with this election is that, um, as I pointed out in one of the shows, Blacks led the coalition that put Trump out of the White House and preparing him possibly for the jailhouse and put Biden in. Now, Biden has been someone that has not been pursuing a Black agenda. I mean, he played a big role in so-called criminal justice reform that put a whole lot of Blacks in prison. And he, he did a lot of other things that are far from right. Uh, but the fact is, he's now put in a position where his base has put pressure on him. And so as a result, you have this infrastructure bill. You just had the bill that was passed for nearly 2 billion, 1.9, uh, that went to a lot of people who are poor, you know? And uh, while it's not enough, and you can criticize every piece of it, and I do, uh, it's more than has been done before. And it's because of the pressure that's come from the grassroots. It's come from the movements that occurred last summer around George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor, and many others. And it's come from uh, COVID-19 and the anger and frustration people have on that and the role that Trump played in the rising death rates and everything else. But the key point that I'm making here is that there are a lot of provisions inside of this infrastructure bill that uh, Blacks need to be pushing, assuming that this gets through the Senate, to see that it goes into Black communities that benefit Black businesses, uh, for one thing. Um, money that goes into low and moderate income housing uh, for another thing. Uh, and a host of other things that will at least be a step in terms of dealing with poverty. It is not the answer, but it is a piece and we need not have our eyes closed to it. And I think the fact that um, he put forward uh, some environmental uh, proposals is important. And what black communities need to be pushing for is the ending of um, fossil fuels, the use of fossil fuels, knocking it out, coal and everything else, which is heating up uh, the, the climate and will make this planet uninhabitable in a very short period of time. So his proposals on environment is far from what's needed. And, but at least he's addressing it. Blacks need to be pushing him further uh, on that. Um, King talked about a guaranteed annual income. That's something that should be put on the agenda, which means that if you're making 30,000 a year, the government should be providing the money to make up the difference so you make 60 or 70,000 a year, depending on what part of the country you live in, 60 or 70,000 isn't hardly enough uh, if that's the income of a whole family, particularly on the West Coast. But the poor are living on 15,000, 20,000 a year for those who have jobs. So this is not radical transformation, but these are reforms that if you're hungry and going to bed and, and you can't, don't have anything to eat, those things really matter. And so while there's a long-term agenda of restructuring transformation, it's gotta be a short-term agenda for dealing with people's livelihood uh, right now. Um, Biden right now has a proposal to tax the rich to pay for his infrastructure. And what he's doing is raising the tax rate back up to what it was on the rich before Trump got in. And that's fine, but they, they need to be a bigger tax on the rich. Remember, until Reagan got in office, uh, there was a 90% tax on the wealthy who had a certain amount of income, 
and Reagan brought it down to the 30s, and now you got it in the 20s. And most, a lot of corporations aren't paying anything. But meanwhile, when the IRS does any kind of audit, they're auditing poor people and working people. And a little bit of what's left of the middle class, the rich are getting off without paying taxes and um, you know having more money than they can ever count. So this idea of uh, tax on the rich is good, but it needs to be much larger. But there needs to be a dramatic cut in the defense budget. Nobody wants to talk about that one. And in fact, Biden increased the defense budget by I think it was 10 billion. What, to fight the Cubans? The only country left that's really Marxist in name is Cuba. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and all Cuba tried to do is look out for its own people. You know, they ain't got no army, no navy, no air force to speak about. You know what I mean? So give me a break, you know? And the Russians ain't even playing around with that anymore, but you're treating them like they're the enemy. They saved you in World War II. They lost 27 million. But as soon as the war was over, Truman had pointed them out to be enemy number one, Cold War, justification for this military budget. There's no justification for this. Mm -hmm. And so while there's a small number in the Congress who are talking about cutting this budget, this doesn't hardly show up. It's over a $700 billion budget. Slash it in half. Two thirds. You know what I mean? I mean, who's coming to invade this country? Who? Martians? <laughs> huh? So King's point about restructuring is important. That's a long-term one. And, and we need to be preparing for that right now. Like some groups in Black Lives Matter, they're using uh, money that they may have to shape up cooperative economics in the black community, building up black businesses that are collectively owned. That's good, we need that, you know what I mean? Since we lost 40% of our businesses with COVID-19, we definitely need to rebuild that. So there's a host of things that, that we need to be doing, but what I'd say to the viewers of this show is, if you're not already in an organization that's doing something, to advance the needs of our people, get in one. Because all this knowledge, what's it for? Is it just so that you can share it? That's important. But are you living it? And you know, I think that's King's leg legacy, that's Malcolm's, that's Fannie Lou Hamer, that's Ella Baker, that's Asata Shakur. It's, it's the legacy of our people. And so that's what this show is dedicated to. Some activism, some walk that matches your talk. And that's why we've been privileged to have the foremost expert on the real, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And when that comes out as a book, that's gonna be, you know, you, you know we used to say in the 60s, a bad mother for you. That's gonna be one bad piece. <laughs> and I'm encouraging Professor May New to put that out. You've already written it. I know knowing you, you're probably gonna wanna go back and touch it up and do whatever you have to do, but that needs to come out because that's the only piece that I've seen that tells the real truth on the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And if you don't get anything else from this, I'm not in, in the philosophical position that King, King ended up with. I joined the movement, it was nonviolent. We were tactical. He was, that was his way of life, but I respect that. He was a nonviolent revolutionary. And of course he understood his circumstances. It wasn't like you could just pick up a gun and take the government, you know what I mean? This is a different circumstance. But I respect this man deeply because of what he stood for. And you know, that he stood on the side of the people. Yeah, he made a few little compromises every now and then. But the fact is on essential issues, he did not compromise. And he's, he's just a shining example of the best that comes out of our people. So this wasn't just to go into the assassination, this is to go into the man, but you better understand your government did this. Quit running around here talking about my government. What a wonderful government we got. Wonderful for what? You hear me? <laughs> Remember, I told you I'm the OR, original revolutionary, huh? 
<laughs> yeah, I like people that stand for principle. They don't have to agree with me. I don't have to agree with them on everything. As long as on the essentials, they are standing for what's right. Someone was asking me what I think of Angela Davis. I said, I got nothing but the highest respect for that woman because she stood on principles. Unassuming Southern black lady, no big ego. I never see her with no entourage when I see her. She stood on principles. I don't have to agree with her on everything. I do agree with her on essentials. Need to eliminate prisons. <laughs> I'm sure if that had been presented to King Ben, he might have said yes to that because guess who's occupying the prisons? You know what I mean? So all I want to say is, um, Menu, this has been enjoyable. Yes, sir. Um, black people lucky to have scholars like this who are really looking out for the interests of black folks. And this right here, he's a community scholar. He goes into Africa, he does his digs. He hasn't talked to you about that. By the way, before we end, you should tell him, you know, the title of your latest book. So he's a researcher, he's a scholar, but he's someone that's sharing for the community, but taking some radical positions. Yeah. What's the name of your book? Yeah, the, my, my latest book is A History of African Civilizations. And uh, it came out of a class that I teach at Contra Costa College, which itself comes out of my field work over the last 30 years doing original primary research in Africa. So it's a history of African civilizations and people can get that from me just by going directly from my web to my website, mainnewampim.com. And that latest book is there as well as uh, some of my ongoing uh, field work, original field work in Africana studies over the last 30 years, a couple dozen countries. So that's the latest work. Also, last week I was addressing this, uh, the other book, another book I wrote on the death of the Willie Lynch speech, Exposing the Myth, which is one of the great myths among Black folks in the, in the modern era. So those are some of the works. But my work on African civilizations, that's what I'm uh, absolutely passionate about. And my latest book is part of that field research. Yeah, an excellent book too. And uh, sure. he was just in passing stating that He's the one that wrote a little book showing you that there was no Willie Lynch. I know some of you who watch this show got an investment in Willie Lynch. Guess what? We were too smart for that. Yeah, there were elements of it, but there was no Willie Lynch. And, and he actually wrote a little booklet on it. And there were some people not too happy, Black people not too happy to be told the truth. <laughs> so that was really good. You know what I mean? Really good. And again, he did his investigatory skills to flesh this out. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm really proud of you, brother. Now, there's some comments here. Uh, and um, let's see if there's some. OK, here's one from uh, Brother Joseph. Animal agriculture is the leading cause of greenhouse and gas emissions, not burning fossil fuels. Renewable energy requires mining of green conflict minerals that are sourced in the global south. Yeah, that's a good point that animals emit a lot of emission, but so does coal and all the other uh, fossil fuels, that as well. Industrialization itself is a real cause of global warming. The whole way in which Western um, economies and Western um, science has waged war on nature. You got any comments on that one? Well, you know, we have, a, I, I organized a Save Nubia project, which is kind of a, a equivalent issue to this because, you know, dealing with with um, building dams has been very destructive. So to create electricity, rather than using nature, rather than using solar energy or um, wind turbine or micro hydro to create electricity, but to use and build large dams is very destructive. It's destructive to the ecology, it's destructive to local displaced communities, and it's destructive to archeological sites. So this is one of the huge issues that is the, a problem in, um, in, the, in the East African region of building of large dams. It's not to help the people, it is for, for folks involved to make money. And that's why I organized the Save Nubia project because it doesn't make sense to do field work and scholarly work and just deal with the past and not be concerned about the ongoing 
living conditions of present uh, living communities today. So that's been my response to the environment and the destructive approach to just do anything you want, building big dams that's not to help local people. So our Save Nubia project has been able to draw a lot of uh, attention to help and protect these local communities. Yeah, you know, it's interesting in Meru Nature uh, or the language of ancient Kemet, dams were considered an offense, something that was wrong because they understood that what it would do, you know, the damage that it would do to nature. Uh, I know the Aswan Dam in Egypt brought on a plague of rats. It ended uh, this whole area in which the Aswan Dam worked of the uh, flooding that would occur naturally every year of the Nile, leaving a rich black alluvial land uh, that would, you know, uh, reinvigorate the earth. And instead it led to all the rest of this stuff. So uh, that's a very, very important point. Um, there's uh, Brother Joseph, Joseph Darashini. Uh, Biden is ramping up his genocide against Black Americans. He just passed a crime bill that will target Black people. He just gave millions to illegals and Native Americans. What are you talking about? Um, yeah, um, I'll have to go read his uh, crime bill. I haven't seen it. Um, and I don't see anything wrong with giving money to uh, Native Americans or people of color. I think there's something wrong when you are uh, throwing out um, large numbers of people of color, including Haitians, Afro-Haitians uh, have been uh, removed from this country under the Biden administration with uh, no checks on it. So if it's true that uh, he's got a crime bill then we need to oppose it, if it's one that's working against us. Um, Sun Temple, Martin Luther King also said to Harry Belafonte that we're integrating into a burning house. Wanna make a comment on that one? Yeah, exactly. Well, he said, he said that <clears throat> we don't want to integrate into a burning house. Right. So he's criticizing the old former focus on integration. That's his point, is that it's illogical to integrate into a burning house. This is Dr. King's position, that the house is burning, the house is corrupt, and that's not what we're focusing on. So that's his position. And Harry Belafonte, of course, the great um, <clears throat> uh, the musician and singer, was one of those handful of um, uh, famous musicians that used their notoriety to have concerts to raise money for the movement. And mm. so, yeah, he was there and did made a great impact. Yeah, um, true. Let's see if there's anything else. Okay. Um, Lao Tzu had a question, Professor Mayu Ampen, what's your assessment of the book Codename Zaro? With Dick Gregory and Mark Lane, I thought it was a good book um, because they, they go on the inside to deal with the FBI's perspective on King and their motivation for orchestrating and, and to, to really target King. So that book, that's, what, that's one of the many books that I did use in the 80s when I was working on my work on Dr. King and codenamed Zorro. Uh, the name in Spanish means fox. And they, under Hoover, believed that King was dishonest like a fox. And so um, they had no respect for King. And, and that's why they gave him that title. But the book itself is very well done because it definitely documents the inside criminal behavior of the FBI led by Hoover. And the viewers should also know that um, the FBI's criminality is well documented, that, that J. Edgar Hoover was not only um, concerned about King, but he was concerned about John and Robert Kennedy. And he went beyond just basic surveillance. J. Edgar Hoover was, was a nasty guy who wanted to know all about their sexual and bedroom activities. 
So it was a strange person. He's the head of the chief law enforcement agency. He's ahead of that, and yet he's breaking all of the laws. But uh, I think that book is a very well put together book some decades ago because it talks about the inside work and perspective of the FBI, FBI as they broke the law repeatedly to go after political enemies. Yeah, I read that book too. I thought it was an excellent book. Um, there are a few other comments and then we'll wrap up. These aren't questions, but um, Black Voltron Reloaded. Thanks again, Dr. Deshaka and Dr. Ampen for another great broadcast. Fanya McKinney, my buddy, thank you both for your ongoing work to educate our people. Um, Erica, no ornery girl, McCoy. <laughs> I like those names. <laughs> thank you, Professor Maynu. Your work is needed and appreciated. Um, and she also said, tell the truth. Robin Hughes, definitely waiting for the book. Thank you. Uh, do you know Robin? Rob, what's the last name? He, Robin he, Hughes. Not offhand. Yeah, she lives, she lives in San Francisco. Yeah. Okay, so I want to thank everybody for tuning in. But Maynu, bad, brother. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Doc, I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to continue to hold it down and uh, and really help to liberate the legacy of Dr. King from those dishonest and, and misinformed people who continue to promote the dream. And by the way, the dream has a financial angle to it, too. The dream sells. And this is one reason why people are promoting this nonsense rather than the real King when the hot coals hit his lips in 67 and 68 and then 66. And uh, he pissed off all of these liberals and all that. That's the king we need to really understand and recognize. And so my work is to do just that, to make sure that I help to liberate his legacy and make sure that he does not continue to be the most misrepresented figure in US history. So we need to rise up by looking at his work. He's a practical man and his program that he lays out is something that we certainly can embrace and advance even in uh, the early 20th century, 21st century. Yeah, you know, the bigger the threat, the bigger the, dis the uh, uh, distortion. So uh, we need the correction and Professor Menu Ampin is providing that. And I encourage people to um, hit the subscriber button and we'll be with you next week. Thank you, Menu. Okay, okay, thank you, Dr. Shaka. I appreciate it. Folks can catch me at MenuMpin.com. Over and out and we continue to advance the work. Right on. Thank you. Thank you.